Hello everyone, my name is Karina Urquhart and I'm the Executive Director at BIC and your host for this session. It's great to see that we have so many of you turn, turning, tuning in even <laughs> to this BIC event, uh, which is all about the environmental impact of distribution and freight in the book industry. This event is kindly sponsored by Penguin Random House. So this session is the third in our series of Green Bic Brunches that we've created specifically to explore key areas of the book supply chain that impact on our planet's environmental health. Each Green Bic Brunch will be dedicated to one key area of the supply chain, whilst the series as a whole is intended to join the book industry together in one place, exploring and inspiring change in response to environmental challenges, all part of Big Screen Promise. We'll be tweeting about this event today using the hashtag Green Bic Brunch, which is on the screen there in front of you. So do please feel free to join in. Um, more information about our forthcoming brunch webinars can be found on our website via the links that you can see on your screen there. Um, we'll be sharing the slides from this session later on on our website. So if you don't get a chance to, to scribble down the, uh, the links, don't worry, uh, you will be able to, um, to have that information later. So, here's the agenda for this session. So you'll see we've got four speakers lined up for you. So um, we have Neil Springall, Head of Operations at Penguin Random House, Sue Matthews, Project Manager at Loadhog, Ken Rhodes, Chief Executive Officer at United Independent Distributors, and Dave Thompson, Group Sales and Development Director at Publiship. There's a dedicated 10 minute time slot um, allocated at the end of the session uh, for questions. So do feel free to post any questions that you may have uh, in the text box, uh, you know, as the speakers are speaking, or you can, you can save them up to the end of the session. It doesn't really matter. We'll keep an eye on those questions as they come in. So just some housekeeping before we get started. Um, You'll notice that we've muted you all. This is to make sure that the sound quality for this event is the best it can be. Um, this is really important because the event's being recorded. If you have a question to ask our speakers during the dedicated question uh, Q&A session, please just type your questions into the chat box, as, as I've already said. Um, and we, we, will, we will go through those if, if we have time or well, time permitting. Muted. Unmuted. So then, so this event is brought to you by BIC, uh, Book Industry Communication. For those of you who don't know already, we are a not-for-profit members organisation at the heart of the book industry, creating standards, best practices and resources that form part of the DNA of your supply chains, helping your organisations become more efficient, save money, become less wasteful and ultimately greener. We're at the cornerstone of the book industry, holding a unique position of trust, facilitating UK and international industry-wide collaboration to reach agreement on dependable standards and best practice in the supply chain. So I'm just going to mute everyone because there seems to be some background noise. So I'll just do that. Thank you. Please do mute, please do stay muted throughout. Um, it just helps with the with the recording. Thank you. Um, so, it's in the supply chain that uh, significant changes can be made by the book industry to lower our carbon footprint and improve our green credentials. BIC, as the long-established dedicated supply chain organisation, has the environment naturally high on its, um, on its agenda, on its strategic priorities for 2020 and beyond. We're committed to championing the green agenda and providing leadership to, to, to give organisations the tools and resources to help them make their supply chains greener and more sustainable. Check out our BIC Green Hub, the link is on the screen there. Um, this is a resource for the book industry where we'll share information on how we can be greener and we'll use it to showcase what BIC, what BIC is doing to help organisations achieve that goal. Take a look, um, the, link, the link is there for you. Um, so today's session will provide an overview of the environmental impact of distribution and freight in the book industry after the care and attention further upstream in the book creation and production processes, 
Ensuring those books are shipped, delivered on time and to the right place is crucial to a successful supply chain and ultimately a healthy book industry. But what impact does it have on the environment? Today we'll learn about what the book industry can do to ensure its carbon emissions and other environmental factors with regards to this um, are, are done as greenly and as efficiently uh, as possible without jeopardising. It's getting that balance between um, business operation and commercial success, but also um, taking care of the environment and the planet. So with that in mind, I'm going to pass you over now to Neil Springle. Neil is Head of Operations at Penguin Random House, um, and Penguin Random House are the sponsors for this event. Uh, Neil is going to talk uh, briefly about what Penguin Random House have been up to on the green distribution front before handing over to their co-presenter from Loadhog, who will give a bit more detail. So over to you, Neil. Remember to unmute yourself. Yes, hello everybody. Um, I'm delighted to, delighted to uh, represent Penguin Random House today at today's webinar, uh, which we have kindly hosted and sponsored. Um, we find ourselves in a very strange environment and uh, I think I may well have met some of you in October of last year uh, when we last presented in London and told you about some of the great initiatives that we'd started in our five-year plan back in 2018. But as I said to a very dear friend of mine yesterday, if I'd have said at that time a year ago that in a year's time you'll get to all share an office with your proposed other half of choice and that you would always be at home on time, then I'm sure we, um, we would have all probably laughed at that fact. Uh, but that is the environment we are now in. That hasn't in any way stopped our ambition and, and indeed our desire to try and tackle um, the big green question. And in 2018, PRH and indeed our friends and colleagues within DK launched a very ambitious and quite challenging five-year environmental plan, certainly within our distribution establishments, foc focusing initially on reducing single-use plastics, such things as shrink wrap, packaging and indeed carton void fill which consists of a lot of plastic bubbles being sent around the world and then unfortunately having to recycle them before they ended up in our oceans and waste sites. Um, I, that's pretty much it for my introduction. I'm going to let the presentation do the talking um, and we would like to commence by at the start showing a short video clip of approximately three minutes just to show you some of the exciting things we've been doing with Loadhog and then we'll go straight into the presentation itself. Uh, I don't think we can show the video, Neil, but the link. Okay, the okay, link, so we'll send it to you via the link. <laughs> we'll do yeah, it via the link. Certainly see it on the link. Yeah. So if we can go to the next slide, please, and I invite um, Sue, Sue to join me from Loadhog, and then we can carry on straight with the presentation. Thank you. Great. Okay, so uh, next up is Sue Matthews, project manager at Loadhog, um, and as Neil says, she's going to talk to us about returnable packaging, market changes, circular economy, and how the work, um, and all about the work that they've, they've done with Penguin Random House. So uh, over to you, Sue. I'll just get your slides up for you. There we go. Thanks, Karina, and thanks for asking us to present at the BIC event today. You're welcome. The following slides that I've, that I've put together are going to advise companies um, that have gone or are going to actually go returnable. Next slide. So returnable packaging is where a business can use the products time and time again in a closed loop system. Not only can this be used with the onward flow of goods, but also upstream from their supplier. The packaging eradicates single-use plastic that can cause damage to the environment and added costs along with labour inefficiencies. Next slide. So we all know by now that good old Aidy Vattenborough brought this to all our attentions. This initially impacted the consumer side with a levy on carrier bags in shops, but now most companies are also sitting up and listening and looking at ways to go green. People are now taking on board the three R's recycled, returnable and recyclable into their supply chains. Next slide. So with the COVID pandemic, as Neil mentioned earlier, businesses have had to make supply chains slicker, along with introducing next day deliveries quicker than anticipated. Supermarkets had a three to five year plan to open more home delivery slots, but this had to be delivered within weeks, not years. E-commerce led the way with next day and home deliveries. This means less stock just in time. 
and more and more companies looking to invest in automated warehousing. Although looking at COVID during the lockdown period, this had a somewhat negative effect on the environment, with companies requiring their products urgently with no time to pick, pack and deliver into returnable packaging. But the race for green there was certainly stepping back up. Next slide. So here at Lodog, we hold both the ISO 14001 environmental and 9001 quality accreditations. We offer swap out schemes, which enable customers to have their old and broken plastic packaging recycled and used again to produce new products. This creates a greener and more circular economy and something that we encourage customers to do so old plastic does not sit in landfill. Next slide. So we're a multi-award winning employee owned business based in Sheffield, where we manufacture and ship on a global basis. We have our own designers who work day in and day out to come up with designs to eliminate customers one trip plastics and ease supply chain pressure. Along the top are a handful of customers we have helped with this with various products that we manufacture. Next slide. So the pallet lid. This comes in either two or four strap depending on your application. It has integrated straps which are attached to the underside of the pallet as you can see from the animation and then tension to provide the stability when in transit. The application takes around 20 to 30 seconds as opposed to three to four minutes to actually shrink wrap your pallet. Penguin opted for the two strap lid where Neil will talk you through the process. Next slide. Neil. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sue. Um, yes. So we were delighted to uh, get involved with Loadhog having seen the lid, um, believe it or not, on a YouTube clip uh, back in um, early 2018. And we decided uh, to reduce single use plastic, we would tackle shrink wrap which we uh, endeavour to uh, send out on just about every export and internal UK distributed um, pallet delivery and focus initially on the main UK uh, side of it and reduce 47 cent within 2018 alone. Now the lid itself is very simple. Um, you will see from the link uh, that we will send you later that you can watch the video of the uh, lid in, actually in action on our, on our warehouse floor. Um, but it really consists of just the lid being laid on top of the of the cartons and as you saw in the last slide the straps being brought down to attach to the pallets itself therefore not requiring shrink wrap to hold the, the actual packages onto the pallet itself we also started to look at the chance of reducing our plastic usage within our cartons uh, at this stage of the year we're sending approximately 4,000 cartons a day from our distribution site here in Colchester and as you see from the bottom photos on this slide, it used to consist of uh, plastic being wrapped over the book and then uh, effectively shrink wrapped or heat, heat sealed over the top of the books to stop the movement and damage in, trans in transit. We've now started to replace that with uh, reduced, um, or sorry, recycled uh, cardboard uh, that actually comes in via our in, in goods in, inbound, shredded down to then be shredded card into the, uh, to fill the void area. And this helps achieve our reduction of 47% in total. Uh, and the next slide, please. So supply chain mapping. <clears throat> this is something that we offer to Penguin. So by mapping out the inbound and outbound lanes, it can become clearly visible early on where the closed loops actually are. This then enables the customer to decide the best way to initiate returnable packaging into the supply chain and build a solid business case. It also adds simplicity when introducing returnable equipment and makes the process run more smoothly. What this enabled Penguin to do is to see where they needed to either force a closed loop in or actually see where the closed loop already existed and then enabling them to discover more downstream opportunities for this application. Next slide. So the lid, as you can see from this slide, helped Penguin improve not just efficiency in the process, but also vehicle fill enabling double stacking and, as Neil mentioned, the elimination of 47% of plastic within the first year of usage. Penguin added more value to this by adding asset tracking onto, on themselves. Neil, could you expand on this? Yes, yeah, so a simple um, RFID tag uh, was actually put inside the lid, in the inside of the lid, which allows us to uh, use a wand to scan out every single lid to an end destination. 
So for argument's sake, uh, if we had a 26 pallet load going to a certain wholesale customer, we would scan the, we'd scan the lids involved. We would then tell the customer we were sending those specific numbered lists to encourage them then to return those, those lids back to us within the uh, return cycle. And this has worked exceptionally, exceptionally well uh, to make sure that we haven't lost a single lid in over 18 months of usage. Next slide. So Sky Unipart have also implemented the use of the lid. This takes an average of 20 seconds to secure and it achieves a 69% reduction in labour time and it actually reduced their shrink wrap by 10.2 tonnes. They achieved such significant savings that they would bring shrink wrap pallets down, take off the wrap and test all products on the pallet before having to re-shrink wrap and static store in the racking prior to them going out to the customers. This means that they were wrapping the pallet on average about two to three times due to their product testing process. Businesses can save more than they realise when looking at this factor. Next slide. So I think this is a quite hard hitting slide, to be honest. Lodog have estimated through the use of the lid in 2019 across all customers, 108 million metres of one trip plastic has been removed from supply chains and waste to landfill. This is a significant amount from how businesses used to work. And the great thing is, is that businesses are taking it one step further because this amount of single use plastic is just our involvement. They also do things like Penguin have initiated by looking at other, other areas of the business, i.e. the internal way that they actually pack their books. Next slide. Along with this particular product, we also manufacture a range of returnable packaging, which is also aimed at reduction in labour and simpler greener supply chains. Penguin also took some pallies, which you can see on the right hand side of the slide, which gave them a quicker replan within the warehouse. The pallet itself is a wheeled unit, which has got a bearer, which acts as a brake, which can carry two 600 by 400 totes side by side. You can have a handle where you can push, pull it, you can push it, and it can also be lifted with a forklift truck. Next slide. So what does it take to achieve it? I think there has to be buy-in from the users. Start by compiling pain points within the supply chain. Evaluate these by savings that could be achieved and the positive effects on the environment. Even the smallest changes will make the difference. This can be achieved as we have seen with both the Penguin and Sky case studies on the previous slides. One of the biggest internal challenges is going from traditional consumable packaging to returnable as people are sometimes resistant to that change. From a logistical point of view, sometimes closed loops have to be forced in to achieve this, but it is possible as Sky and Penguin have actually shown. But from a personal point of view, I think you also need people who are passionate to push this process along, like Neil and Tanya from Penguin, who can see the long term benefits and care about the impact on their operation. So the, the, the last slide that I've actually got, Neil's going to actually talk you through this one. Yes, yeah, just conscious of time. Um, but if you see there's five stages here, we've really only focused in year one on the single use plastics before we will now switch our attentions towards some of the other great environmental saving initiatives we have in reducing uh, with carbon emissions with our suppliers, energy, energy consumption, waste, and indeed biodiversity. Um, I appreciate the, uh, the time today that we've been given. Um, I would say if we can move on to the next slide, it does give our contact details when you receive uh, this, but equally, if you would like to uh, look us up on uh, LinkedIn um, and talk to us beyond this uh, uh, webinar, I'd be more than happy to talk to any of you and thank you for your time today. Thank you. Um, fascinating. The, the what, what, quite incredible that statistic, 108 million meters of single use plastic eliminated that, that that's incredible. Was that, was that in the first, is that overall or was that in the first year? I can't remember what was on the slide. Uh, that was in 2019. That was just in one year. Amazing. That was, um, just, that was just in one year, yeah. yeah. <laughs> with just with that particular product, the lid, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, what was the other thing I was going to mention was uh, it's interesting as well, the time saving, uh, as well as the obvious, the green um, uh, benefits, um, it, it's the time saving element as well, which, which, which can only be a good thing too. So, um, yeah, yeah, I can probably answer that. I can probably quickly answer that one. Um, it was taking us on average about two and a half minutes to um, to actually physically shrink wrap um, on our automated shrink wrapping machines. 
Um, it takes less than 15 seconds now to apply a lid and, and make it secure, ready for transit. Mm. Brilliant. OK, we have a, a question come in, but what I'll do is, in the interest of time, I will save it up till, till the end. So um, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, and uh, now we will move on to our next presenter, who is Ken Rhodes. Let me just get his slide up. There we go. Um, Ken is the Chief Executive Officer at United Independent Distributors and we're going to hear from Ken today all about a distribution organisation at the beginning of their environmental journey uh, and how they're identifying and reacting to challenges and addressing their legacy issues in order to incorporate change in both their culture and their operation now and for the future. Um, so over to you, Ken. If you're there, yeah, I'm here. Uh, thank <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank, thanks very much, Karina, and uh, thanks to Penguin Random House uh, for sponsoring this event and for that presentation. Um, uh, th th this this slide here is is just the homepage for United Independent Distributors. Um, the company was formed in 2019. Uh, as, a, as a vehicle really to purchase Marston and Orca uh, book services and um, then uh, in 2020 earlier this year uh, they purchased Turpin distribution and Eurospan a largely academic and professional um, sales marketing and distribution business mainly for American publishers uh, I was formerly the managing director director of uh, Eurospan and, and joined UID as uh, as CEO back in uh, back in May, um, and uh, to 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 begin the pro process of uh, integrating these. If we go to the next slide. Um, as we're uh, mostly, uh, I guess, publishers here, I thought I'd, I'd start with some books from uh, my publishing uh, uh, life and history. Um, I'm actually old enough that um, back in the late 1980s and late 1990s, early 1990s, there were serious uh, environmentalists who were proposing that actually it would be a good thing if we all ran diesel cars. And ran diesel cars on the grounds that if we all did this because their engines lasted so much longer there'd be fewer cars manufactured and that this would be a, a good thing for the environment and i only bring this up just really to 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 say that, that you know the world does change and opinions change uh and, and i'll come on to that a, a little bit further the book on the left is the skeptical environmentalist which i think was published in 2002 by cambridge university press uh, uh, by Bjorn Lomborg and I saw that uh, a couple of weeks ago he was having another book uh, reviewed uh, I saw in the Telegraph. Um, he's an, uh, uh, an interesting man and this was an extremely controversial publication because his basic thesis was that whatever we do uh, in terms of environmental protection we mustn't damage the economy while we do it because his thesis was basically that technology will get us out of trouble. Um, this uh, led to many, uh, Cambridge at the time actually was still, was also publishing the IPCC manuals, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and uh, that led to conflicts with many authors actually leaving the press as a result of the publication of this book. The other book is Reflective Teaching. This is actually readings for Reflective Teachings, but when I was at Continuum, this was a mainstay of our publishing and a, a really important set of books just for um, culture. It's about uh, pedagogic practice, really, and, and how one um, uh, uh, improves culture and process by reflecting on what you're doing and how that impacts your behavior. Uh, next slide, please, Karina. And uh, and this leads to, to to some principles about what we're doing uh, at UID in in this environment. And that is uh, one to act on on the evidence that requires uh, a deal of engagement um, with research and uh, research itself into the things that that you can do that impact 
uh, your performance when measured by environmental impact. And the other is to act on experience. And this is where that sort of reflective process comes in that, uh, that, that, that obviously um, in any environment, you, you, you sort of are just constantly looking and seeing what works and adjusting your behaviors uh, as you go on. Next slide, please. The UID perspective is a difficult one. Um, you know, seeing Penguin Random House with all their their uh, their, their wonderfully uniform uh, box sizes would be would be a joy for me. Um, we are managing multiple publishers, and therefore there's 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 no new unitary voice, and on a on any kind of uh, spectrum of green identity, uh, I suspect we have uh, publishers at both ends of that spectrum. Um, we're actually, uh, I think, I, th I think I have, I've never actually counted, but it, but it's well over 800 publishers that we are working with. And we have uh, pretty well no control over their manufacturing processes, how their books are delivered to us, in what they are delivered. Uh, we are uh, a service provider, and our uh, our, our influence is is um, our influence on those behaviours is important, but it's not decisive. Uh, we also have a, a multi-site uh, inheritance, so uh, clearly operating from many sites is not uh, not an ideal situation to be in. So we have about. Uh, I think of a million square feet of distribution space, which is actually over uh, four reasonable sized sites and one significantly smaller one. And addressing that is uh, a significant issue to us. And then, uh, I, I guess, harking back to the Bjorn Lomborg uh, thing, is the economic imperatives that, that we need to be profitable and we need to make money to, to for, for any of um, the decisions that we want to make and the course that we want to uh, navigate to succeed. Next slide, please. Um, when you're trying to change culture and develop cultures, uh, you often end up speaking about behaviours and communicating those behaviours uh, to um, uh, interested parties, stakeholders, if you like. Uh, and I, I, I just break these down into these four. So uh, within premises, which is uh, getting people to understand that the buildings that we have, however, poor they are in terms of their environmental ratings. There are things that you can simply do within a building to make those uh, have a lower carbon footprint. Uh, working with colleagues and working with, with the behaviours of colleagues, you know, there is a, a, a kind of acceptance that we live in a liberal democracy and that people are entitled to have uh, opinions. And again, they're, they're on that spe spectrum, but as their employer and as an employer, uh, a responsible employer. We have a capability to influence those views and influence their behaviours to uh, adjust them in favour of environmental benefit. Um, with suppliers, again, relatively straightforward that in every contract and every relationship that you enter into to review their credentials and review what, review and uh, frankly test uh, what people say about themselves to ensure that uh, you're not compromising what you're trying to achieve by operating with suppliers who are, are um, uh, less uh, good, if you like, than you are. And then, uh, and then with customers, and uh, clearly the, the kind of things that we were just hearing about from Penguin Random House and Loadhog is brilliant because You've got uh, a publisher of that scale uh, engaging with customers to try and do some of those, uh, those closed loop distribution systems, which will be uh, a great benefit to many other publishers and distributors like UID. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, again, this is a, a, a sort of fairly, uh, well, it's not quite random, but uh, it's, it's a, a not exhaustive list of practical considerations and things that we look at 
and have been looking at uh, uh, from our inheritance where, where quite a lot of this wasn't being uh, examined perhaps as closely as it should be. So all our small orders now are, 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 are self-adhesive cardboard wraps and there's no element of shrink film or bubble wrap in them. We do quite a lot of mailings on behalf of, uh, of clients and the majority of those are now distributed in biodegradable bags and we're working to uh, eliminate uh, any, uh, uh, any plastics within those mailings uh, in 2021. Uh, void fill um, at uh, the Marston Centre in the Orca Centre and shortly uh, at our one at Turpin we actually recycle all the void fill that comes in uh, from other suppliers. Uh, so, so many of those are being uh, reused, uh, which they weren't uh, previously. Uh, and everything we're doing now is, is, is paper or virgin paper if it's not recycled. Uh, again, there's more work to be done there. Uh, as Again, per the previous presentation, there is nothing, frankly, more dis depressing in a distribution centre than watching uh, pallets with stretch film uh, whirring round and round them. The only mitigation currently that we have on that is using automation, which means that the, uh, the, the, the film is stretched as far as it will go, which minimizes its usage. But uh, we are actively investigating ways that we can uh, not use that film. But it's mitigated a little bit by that variety of sizes, columns, and so on, because of uh, the profile of publishers work to do there. Uh, waste streams, uh, again, when we uh, founded the company and started looking at this, we discovered that the waste streams within the business were not uh, as good as they could be, leading to many things that didn't need to go to landfill that were, and we've now got much more um, effective waste streams uh, in place, though, again, there's more work to be done there. Uh, waste books uh, um, for recycling now we're uh, using those to go to building materials uh, for, for new use. Next slide. Um, just in terms of future developments, mostly fairly uh, obvious things here. Um, Tote usage for key suppliers, again, uh, an echo of some of those load hog solutions, uh, which we are uh, actively looking at and we're using them increasingly in uh, internal distributions. Um, I mentioned that we are multi-sites and over the next few years we are doing, we will be doing a lot of work in terms of how we consolidate those and we're opening a new distribution centre about a kilometre from where I'm sitting in, in Biggles Way uh, and that building has a, a building research established environmental assessment method rating of excellent and obviously uh, that comes with um, solar panels, rainwater harvesting and high quality insulation so highly efficient uh, building to be operating within um, which is very important to us and, uh, and will allow us within that new premises to uh, improve our processes uh, with due consideration to our carbon footprint. We have a POD partnership uh, with Print Force, which is basically co-located uh, to that, uh, that, that new distribution center. Clearly, uh, print-on-demand has uh, significant uh, uh, benefits in terms of a lack of wastage and, uh, and stock holding and space and so on, all of which have uh, um, beneficial impacts. But that co-location also allows us to improve consolidation on behalf of our, of our publishing partners, and that uh, has a significant environmental benefit as well. Uh, and again, just echoing uh, a little bit what happened, uh, uh, what, what came through in the uh, Peng Random House uh, presentation, a logistics provision review, which is 
simply uh, testing all our logistics uh, providers uh, against each other and against a scale to ensure that the people that we're utilizing are those that are the most uh, uh, have the lowest carbon footprint. Very good. Um, next slide, my last slide, I think. Um, and I guess uh, uh, this is really just a statement of the uh, of of the the bleeding obvious, and that is that the dilemma here is that most consumers and service users demand cheaper and quicker, and the environment tends to demand slower and more expensive. And it's the reconciliation of these two fundamentally contradictory positions, which I think. I believe will be uh, uh, an incremental process and we do just have to keep testing ourselves, our customers and our suppliers to ensure that, that, that everybody in the chain is playing the best part that they can uh, to, to, to achieve what we need to do. And that's me finished. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you for that, Ken. Um, for that for that presentation there a different you're sort of a different timeline i think uh to penguin random house but it, it's really interesting to see mm. where, where you're sort of starting from and and the the challenges of of, of um the inheritance if you like <laughs> uh and being a multi-site operation um i thought it was really interesting what you said about the uh wasted book recycling going into uh building materials um I might have to ask you a bit more about that later on. <laughs> I, I, I can I can share you the the, the brick like material which comes out the other end if you would like. Yes, yeah, that would be really interesting. Yeah, if you've got a um like a photo of it or a link to it or something, we could we can share it with the attendees when we when we email them afterwards. That that would be uh, fascinating. Yep, <laughs> um, yeah, and the other thing that you're talking about is is that that fine balance, isn't it, between profitability the economy uh, and an environmental care so uh, and I guess that that's a as you said that's an ongoing um, consideration and I guess that that will sort of bend and flex over time as uh, it yes it does uh, I, I mean my, my my view overall is not not to get absolutely hung up on it because I think I think the 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 most important part is is to embed in the culture of your organization what you're trying to achieve uh, and then i think you, you you will tend to carry both clients and customers with you yeah yeah agreed agreed okay well thank you ever so much for that ken and thank you for your time and also the time to prepare it as well um i will now move on to our fourth speaker um, and the final presentation of the day um, from Dave Thompson. Dave is Group Sales and Development Director oh. at <coughs> And Hi, Karina. Hope hello. you can hear me. Yes, yes. And, and Dave's going to talk to us today about, uh, well, he's going to talk to us from the shipper's perspective, uh, what the shipping industry is doing to reduce environmental impact of sea freight uh, and just the sheer scale of it as well. And we'll hear about ballast emissions, slow steaming and things to consider when moving all of those books around the world. So uh, over to you, Dave. OK, thank you very much. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present today. And also thanks to uh, Penguin Random House for sponsoring the event. Um, if you ask people for what they consider to be the, the biggest contributions to globalization, I guess that most people would say um, it would be the internet. Uh, could, could you move on, please? Uh, well, it was the introduction of the shipping container, which was invented in the 1950s, uh, adopted with, with international standards in the 1960s, and then regular services began in the, the 1970s. Um, and it's the shipping container that has really made the, the biggest difference to globalization, uh, allowing unit loads to be moved very quickly and handled very quickly at either end of the, of the, the shipping process. Um, next slide, please. Over 90% over of world trade is moved by sea. Um, and that can be bulk cargo, such as, as oil, sugar, chemicals. And 70% of everything that you my buy in the shops or online has at some time been on a ship. So 
shipping is all around us uh, and pretty much involved, it affects everything we do and buy uh, most of the time. Um, now, if Karina can, can just move on, um, what we want to look at is what the principal uh, factors are uh, and what the, the shipping industry is actually going to do uh, to reduce the impact it has. Um, uh, as Karina mentioned, that we're going to talk about emissions and, and ballast um, on, the, on the next slide. Um, other um, impacts from, from shipping would be things like um, oil spills when the, a ship sinks um, or is in a collision. That there's, you know, we've seen the, the pictures on TV of oil spilling around in the sea. Uh, coastal erosion, particularly when ports are upriver. Um, the bigger ships now are you know, bigger waves, bigger bow waves, and that impacts the coast. Um, land use from the huge container terminals that need to be built to handle all of these ships and containers. And also transport, um, just locally to us now, there is a, a major um, controversy about a road that they want to build um, to factor the extra traffic that will come in from a new berth that was being built at Liverpool. And um, they're arguing about whether this road should go through a greenfield site. Uh, and that's the kind of thing where shipping uh, and transport impacts on the environment in a big way. Um, on the, we're just going to look at emissions and ballast today because of the time limit. But emissions, uh, the main emissions are obviously carbon dioxide, um, but also sulfur oxide and nitrogen oxide. And then we'll look at ballast, um, which is the transfer of species. Um, can you just click, please, Karina? Um, that's it. <laughs> uh, the ballast, which is the transfer of um, species. Um, when water is moved around and, and water pollution from ballast as well. Okay, um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, I think it's useful to get an idea of just how big um, modern container ships are uh, and if, understand the scale of the logistics process in moving cargo around the world. This is the HMM, the Hyundai Algeciras, which was the first of um, 12 vessels built by uh, Hyundai was launched this year, and it's the world's largest container ship, uh, one of 12. Um, and it has 23,960 spaces. If you could just click on, please. Um, that's just another nice picture of it. And, and again, please. Um, so you'll need to click here. So it's 400 meters long, 61 meters wide. Or if you think of 400 meters, four football pitches or a a very long par four on a golf course. Um, and, and 61 meters wide would be as wide as say the M25. Um, the containers are stowed nine high uh, above, sorry, I've done that wrong. It's nine high below deck, 11 high above now. Um, and the, no, sorry, that is right. Nine high above deck, 11, 11 high below. And that makes the ship around the height of a 20 story building. So if you imagine a 20 story building, 400 meters long, uh, moving around the earth, um, it really is uh, an incredible sight. Um, I, if you um, connected all the containers on board, can you just click again? Yeah, that's it. Sorry, I shouldn't have done it that way. Um, all of the containers placed end to end would stretch for nearly 91 miles. That's the equivalent of Felix Stowe to London. So it's just an enormous scale, and, and that's just one vessel. Um, uh, and the, there are about 140 of these going around the world at the moment of this size. Um, although they are able to carry just under 24,000 uh, spaces, they normally operate at around about 19, 19,500 uh, due to weight restrictions and stowage because they won't have the same amount of cargo for each port, so there'll be gaps and things like that. So normally they'll be carrying 19,500 containers. Um, Next slide. Um, they're powered by a single diesel engine, a huge diesel engine, one propeller. Um, and they adjust um, the diesel engine to optimal, optimal fuel consumption. Um, the ships are 40% more efficient than those of 10 years ago, just in the, in the quality of the engines. And 10 years ago, ships were half the size. So apart from being less efficient, they would be two of them 
um, needed to carry the same amount of cargo that one of these big ships can carry now. Um, next slide. One of the um, biggest measures that have reduced emissions uh, is slow steaming. Um, if you reduce the operating speed by 10%, you make a fuel saving of somewhere between 30 and 35%. Um, and I mentioned on the previous slide about the engine being adjusted downwards. So basically, it's a bit more complicated than just going slower. Um, they tune the engine to the speed that it's normally going to operate at. Um, so in the past, um, they would have they would have steamed around about 22 and a half knots. Uh, can I have the next slide? You're going to need to click through this one um, as well, um, Karina. So at normal, what we would call normal speed, um, that would be around about 22 uh, and a half knots. Can you just click? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and at 22 and a half knots, the ship would burn up about 250 tons of fuel a day. Uh, and if you just click again, you'll see that by going down to 20 knots, they burn around about 175 at tons a day but it's a massive saving in fuel um, now at the moment very low sulfur fuel oil costs around 340 dollars a ton so that's a daily saving of over twenty five thousand dollars and on a round trip voyage it's over 1.6 million dollars wow. um, so while the shipping lines have green intentions um, I, I don't deny them that there is a real big impetus for them to save a lot of money um, when you operate in a lot of these ships, if you can save 1.6 million every round trip, then um, you're going to go slower. Uh, and that they do extra slow steaming on the return leg. So when they're taking export cargo, they'll uh, they'll go uh, even slower because most of the ship is full of empty containers to return it out to the Far East, for example. Um, most most trade lanes around the world have an imbalance of trade one way or another. Um, so obviously, coming out of Asia to Europe and out of Asia to the US, there's a lot more trade than there is going back. So the ships will be only half full of loaded cargo on the way back. So they go even slower, about 16 knots. Um, OK, next slide. Um, this is an interesting thing, that if shipping was a country, it would be seventh, the seventh largest outputter of carbon dioxide. Um, you know, it's 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 such a, a huge um a huge number um but that figure is improving uh, and i think when we can finally get an updated table uh, for for 2020 particularly uh, in a couple of years it'll probably be a couple of years before we get 2020 figures but i, I firmly believe we're going to see um international shipping dropping down the league table uh, next slide at the moment uh international shipping accounts for just over 2% of all of the carbon dioxide emissions in the world. But uh, next slide. The, the International Maritime Organization, which uh, is the organizing body responsible for, for global shipping, um, has a target to reduce emissions by 50% by 2050 um, and for emissions to a reduction to begin as soon as possible. Now, this may seem unambitious. I mean, 2050 is a long time off. Um, the problem is that not all members of the IMO actually agreed to these figures. Uh, nine member states voted against them. So, like all of these things, and if something's done by committee, you end up with a fudge. And I think that for a lot of nations, they would have preferred to have a, a much higher figure by a much earlier date. But it's a target, and if people begin their emission reduction, um, you know, who knows? It, it, things may improve uh, dramatically very quickly. Next slide. Um, one thing the IMO have been able to do is to implement uh, reductions of sulfur oxide emissions. Um, from January this year, there was a, a requirement that ships had to reduce output from a maximum of three and a half percent to just a half a percent. Um, and, and before 2020, Ships were generating somewhere between five and ten percent of all of the sulfur oxide emissions globally. So these new measures will see a dramatic reduction in that figure. Um, and if you could just move on, um, Karina, the options for um, meeting those targets uh, were threefold. Uh, if you could just click again, 
Um, low sulfur fuel. Um, sorry, you'll need to keep clicking. <laughs> yeah, low sulfur fuel, exhaust gas cleaning systems, and, and liquefied natural gas. So the low sulfur fuel, it's quite expensive, uh, and it does produce emissions uh, on the land side more than the production of, of the higher sulfur fuel. So there is a slight uh, trade-off there. It's, it's harder to produce and more expensive. But that's the option that most shipping lines have taken. Um, the low, the very, it's called very low sulfur fuel oil. Some um, older vessels and um, so, some shipping lines have made the policy decision to to use um, scrubbers. Um, what what what's been found um, this year is that the vessels that were retrofitted with scrubbers, it's taken a lot longer to to fit them uh, and get them working than was originally anticipated. Uh, and some of those vessels have been delayed quite considerably in coming back into service. Um, only 1% of the, the, the fleet has fitted them or intended to fit them. So it's not a big thing, but it doesn't work quite so well as the low sulfur fuel oil. Uh, the interesting thing is um, the, the liquefied natural gas. It's a cheaper product. Um, there are emissions uh, land side. Uh, if you could just click, Katrina. Um, there are emissions on the land side in production. Um, oh. and it's not as well sorry here you go it's not as widely available as the other products but um, right now uh, French shipping line CMA CGM are building a fleet of uh, LNG container ships and the first of those um, a 23,000 space um, CMA CGM Jacques Sard is actually making its maiden voyage it left Singapore a couple of days ago uh, and it's carrying a world record 20,730 containers. I mentioned before that they operate at less than uh, the 24,000 ship will operate at less than 20,000. But because LNG is lighter, um, uh, that gives the shipping line more to play with in terms of uh, less ballast is needed and they've been able to load more containers on the ship. Um, so it's more expensive. Um, to build the ships, but then there's a payoff later um, in that you can carry more cargo. Okay, next slide. One of the questions that we are always asked, and, it, and in the end, I suppose, as a publisher, this is where the fundamentals come down to, is which is more environmentally friendly, uh, printing in Europe or printing in Asia? Um, obviously, um, a lot of people do print in Asia, um, and so this is quite an important question. Um, to answer. Um, could you just move on, please, uh, Karina? There is a, an international standard called the EM16258, which um, has now been produced for the measurement of transport emissions. Um, and we measure, for example, CO2 emission in kilos per kilometer ton, which is to say the weight of carbon to move one ton one, over a, a one kilometer. Um, and a couple of methods of calculation as well to wheel or tank to wheel. So well to wheel would be the emissions from moving the uh, oil from its original um, production point to a, to a site where it then eventually goes uh, into a tank of a, of a ship or a tank of a truck. And the other one is tank to wheel, which is literally just the, the carbon emissions of the, of the journey uh, uh, without any um, prior uh, production. So um, on the next slide, you'll see um, the CO2 emissions of moving one ton over 5,000 kilometers. A container ship generates uh, 60 kilos and air freight 3,300 kilos. And in between, we have truck. Uh, truck. truck is nearly five times, seven times uh, greater than, than a container ship. But uh, diesel trains are, are still very, very um, efficient. Okay, on the next slide, I've done um, a quick comparison here. So to move five ton of books from Slovakia, uh, say to Oxford, which is a journey of 1800 kilometers, using well to wheel, um, it would generate 770 kilos of carbon. On tank to wheel measurement, 610 kilos of carbon. And on the next slide, um, the comparable uh, journey from Shenzhen to Oxford, allowing for truck at either end um, to move it to and from the, the port. Uh, it generates less, uh, just 630 um, on well-to-wheel and 572 based on tank-to-wheel. Uh, 
But something to consider here is the final destination, because if we were moving to, say, Frankfurt and not Oxford, then Slovakia is a lot closer to, to Frankfurt, and Frankfurt's quite a long way from the sea. Uh, so the figures would be very different um, if we were doing that. Um, for example, the road emissions would decrease to 450 uh, and 360, while the, the sea freight one would increase to 750 and 670. So it's nearly double. Um, so I think ultimately it depends on the final destination uh, of your books as to whether it's better to print in, in, in Eastern Europe or whether it's better to print in Asia. Um, but certainly for UK publishers, C freight is still the better option. Um, next slide. Just just for comparison, to move those five thousand kilos of books by air, it would generate a massive thirty eight tons on well to wheel or thirty one tons based on tank to wheel. So you can see that air freight is definitely not the way to go if you want to be environmentally friendly. <laughs> uh, and something something Ken said earlier about expense. Um, making that calculation between expense and and, out, and efficiency, uh, environmental efficiency. It's something to be considered. Obviously, truck from Eastern Europe is much faster, um, but you're going you're gonna to generate more emissions on it. Uh, and obviously, the air freight shows you, if you're prepared to move things very quickly, then apart from being expensive, it's also very environmentally unfriendly. Um, the, next, the next slide. Uh, and on... Everything we've said so far is kind of out, outside of our control here in a publisher because they're operated by shipping lines and trucks and whatever, and we can't make the decisions on the type of equipment they use or the type of fuel they use. But there are measures that we can do in terms of routing, uh, routing the cargo. So, for example, for everything we send to Scotland, we will send it by rail from Southampton to Glasgow or Felixstowe to Glasgow so that the truck is only used for the short journey to the distribution centre. And moving cargo in Europe, we can move it by barge. Uh, and it's slower, but it's extremely efficient and very, very environmentally friendly. Okay, um, that's it on the emission side. I'll quickly, uh, just finish up talking about ballast. And it's something that I would guess that most people outside the shipping industry don't really understand or consider. But ships have tanks, which they use to, uh, they fill with seawater and they trim the ship. So in, low, in rough conditions, they may take on more ballast to try and make the ship sit lower in the water. Um, they, they balance the ship during unloading and unloading, so um, there's always stability. And also during a voyage, they will have fuel use, which will make the ship lighter come out of the water. So they'll take on more ballast during the journey as well, just to make sure that the, the ship is stable. Um, next slide. Um, the problem with ballast is that if you take on ballast in one port and then discharge it in another port, it could be polluted water. But the greater threat is also for predatory sea creatures uh, and moving them to a new environment. Um, the estimates are that 10 billion tons of water are discharged elsewhere um, every year. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this slide basically is a little graphic which if you get a copy of this presentation, I'll leave you to uh, to see it. I'm conscious of time, but essentially, when you load the ballast water at the source port, you ingest sea creatures as well. And then, if you discharge it at the destination port, then those sea creatures will be um, discharged into the water. Uh, next slide. Um, there are two standards for ballast management. Um, the D1 standard requires the discharge 200 miles from land in water 200 meters deep. And essentially, these are all coastal sea creatures and they can't survive in, in water that far out or that deep. Um, and, the, and that's the older method. Um, and on the next slide, um, there is the D2 standard, which has been effective since 2017. And, and um, basically, the ships now are built with uh, systems such as ultraviolet light. Um, they treat the water, the ballast water with ultraviolet light, which kills off any anything in the water, um, except for very tiny viable organisms. Um, uh, and sometimes it could be chemicals, uh, active chemicals that are used um, in the uh, thing. And examples of uh, uh, um, creatures such as the um, the zebra mussel, the green crab, the sea walnut. If you look them up, 
you'll find that they outperform the indigenous species in places where they've been um, redeposited. They've outperformed the indigenous species and, and changed the ecosystem. And there are hundreds more examples. Um, so that's why ballast was uh, is, is such an important thing, and that's why there's a, a convention now uh, with rules to be um, followed. And ships have to keep logs of all their ballast and what they do. Uh, and on the last slide, um, everyone's driving uh, electric cars these days, or starting to drive electric cars. So how about electric ships? Um, if you can just click, read. You know. <laughs> Yeah, the first electric cargo ship is, is now operating on the Pearl River Delta in China. Um, it can uh, sail 50 miles on one charge. Uh, they can charge it up again in two hours. And if you could just a couple of clicks, uh, that's the ship. And it is used to tra transport coal to a power station, would you believe? <laughs> so, anyway, uh, that's it. If you just couple of clicks more um, and another one. Uh, if you've got any other questions, I realize I've had to rattle through because of the time here, but any questions you've got about your emission, uh, emissions for routes that you have or any other questions, by all means, drop me an email. And that's it. Thanks. Great. Thank you ever so much, Dave. Absolutely fascinating. It's the scale of it that I think it get, gets me, and I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll will have had the same effect on the, on the attendees today as well, um, particularly when you were showing us the map. Um, I think, was it Felix Stowe to London when you, you lay out uh, all the, the stories of a, of a container ship? So, yeah, fascinating. Um, also interesting, the impact um, on wildlife and the ecosystem, which, which I'd not considered before um, from ballast, uh, and the uh, considerable fuel savings from, from slow steaming. Uh, and also the, the financial savings. So yeah, absolutely fascinating. And uh, we should do, we should probably do a, a, a brunch just on this <laughs> uh, in the future. So um, so thank you ever so much for that. Uh, we are over time, but um, I'm going to keep going anyway for as long as people stay on. Um, well, not not you know not all day, <laughs> uh, but for an, another few minutes, um, just because we do have a few questions that have come in um so let's just have a look at them so we've had a question in uh, in the first presentation that says we used recycled cardboard many years ago but got uh, frequent complaints about dust and damage to books so they abandoned it um do any of the speakers have any comments about how to best deal with with those problems yeah so i i probably best because we're the ones um sending it out so uh, we did experience that initially uh, because in operations clearly we like to keep ahead of the game so we actually shredded about a week's worth of what we needed and we found that by day six the cardboard because cardboard is made without boring you the composites of makeup of cardboard it's but it's made in a damp environment to be damp um, but when you shred it of course it dries out and then that subsequently creates the dust but we found that if we didn't do a whole week's worth and we only done what we needed the following day then with the complaints drastically reduced that we experienced in the first month. And I just think over time, customers got used to, but also appreciated the benefits of having purely cardboard to recycle as opposed to, you know, the, the, the whole single use plastic. Great, thank you. Um, and another question is, uh, does the data on shipping suggest that we'd be better off producing books locally? So, uh, I get that's a publisher and a shipper. Well, it's a everything, everybody sort of question, isn't it? So, who who would like to take that one? So, uh, well, sorry, so, sorry, carry, carry on. <laughs> no, I just say Dave probably the best person for the for the local shipping. Uh, the only thing I would say on the publishing side of it is clearly very sadly, um, you know, printing costs involved. Mm. Um, you know, incomparable with for where we where we do obviously get them printed in comparison to the UK, um, and just the sheer scale because you know I know um, there are only limited printers in the UK and and their capacities are only as such that you know at this time of year especially they're 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 doing everything they can just to just to maintain the black and white. Yeah, uh, just to, just to, to to add that to, to that on the shipping side of things, yeah, I and mean, capacity um, is is clearly an issue. I mean, if you, if you 
see the the number of container loads of books we're bringing in at this time of year. Um, I, you know, my understanding of the print industry in the UK is that there's just nothing remotely uh, enough available. Um, and, and you still have the, the, the trucking side, um, it's still uh, higher emissions. I, th I think that there is a case for uh, printing in Europe. Um, clearly, it's a cost a costing. It's more expensive to move books from Europe than it is to move them from China, as well as um, as, as well as um, more uh, emissions. So I think it's a balance that people have to strike. Do they need the books quickly? Um, can they can they go slower? Can they save money and save uh, on emissions? But again, as I said before, it all depends on the final destination. Mm. Um, you know, if you're shipping them abroad, some people are printing in this country and shipping them abroad, so you're giving yourself the same problem. Um, you know, if you've got books to ship to Australia, we, we, we've in the past had people who've brought books from, the, from China to the UK and then ship them out to Australia, mm. which, is, which is absolutely crazy, you know, because we can just ship them directly from uh, China to Australia and save a, a massive amount of time, but obviously a massive amount of emissions as well. Yeah, sure. Exactly. Um, also, I, I do wonder as well, we, we talked about the getting things uh, going slower, how that can have a positive impact. So I just, I'm sort of thinking out loud, really. I wonder if, the, if there's any mileage in doing some analysis somewhere to see, you know, would the, would the end consumer be um, open to having deliveries later if they knew that there was a positive environmental impact. I don't know. I, I don't have the answer to that question. It's just, just something that, that has been um, uh, has been in my sort of my thoughts over the last few months or so. But um, but yeah, it would be interesting to know what 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 that um, what the consumer might think to, to that. Um, I think I think the answer might be in in the popularity of Amazon Prime because um, people. You know, Amazon Prime is so popular because you can click on something at seven, seven or eight o'clock at night yeah. and it's delivered the next morning. Yeah, next day. yeah, yeah. But if if they knew that maybe by taking it, you know, getting it in five days' time would save X amount of carbon emissions, impact on the environment, whatever. I don't know. It'd be interesting to see if yeah, people would it would, go, it would, would be go interesting. slower. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one last question. Uh, it's for Load Hog or Penguin Random House on the question of returning the pallet lids from the customers. How does this get organized? Um, do the customers have to arrange this themselves or are they returned when they next get a delivery? Okay, so exa exactly that. I'm probably best placed again to answer that one without stealing the limelight from Sue's, Sue. Um, but uh, yes, we do exactly that. A lot of ours, we have a return loop um, and we subsequently go and send more delivery. So we've bought a substantive amount of the, of the lids um, certainly sufficient enough to allow us to get, let them go out of the network and come back in maybe a week to 10 days afterwards. Um, and we've built up a an element of trust with certain larger customers and wholesalers to enable us to track them both out and back into our, our current uh, distribution destination. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think given the time, I think uh, it's time to call this big brunch to a close um so it's unfortunate we have run out of time we're over time <laughs> um so i'd just like to sum up and just say that it has been a great session hearing from all of our speakers today as i'm, I'm sure our attendees uh, would agree um we've learned we've learned about returnable packaging market changes circular economy uh, we've heard from a distribution organization at the, the start of their environmental journey um, and, and we've heard about what the shipping industry is doing to, to reduce the environment, environmental impact of sea freight and, and how that relates to, to the book industry as well. Um, we've seen how just even just one change, so for example, the, 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 um, the load hogs, the load, load hog lid, how that can make a huge difference. Um, especially with regards to the elimination of uh, single-use plastic, um, but also in terms of time savings. Um, we've talked about the balance between profitability and environmental care. Uh, and again, at the expense of re repeating myself, the scale of shipping and the scale of its impact on both the environment, um, or the ecosystem and wildlife as well. But, but what I have to say is every time we do one of these green sessions, I'm always encouraged and inspired by what I hear from all of our speakers from 
all sorts of organizations in the book industry that there is so much going on at, a, at an environmental level and I, I think generally as an industry we should we should be very proud um, of what we're what we're if not already achieving starting to achieve and, and and what everyone is working towards I think I think it's fantastic and I think it's a fantastic time to be working both in the book industry and in the supply chain as well so um, before I go, I would just like to take this opportunity to say a massive thank you to all of our speakers on behalf of everyone here. Um, so thank you, Neil, Sue, Ken and Dave for taking the time out of your day um, to present today and also the preparation work um, that, you, that has gone into it as well. Um, to all of our attendees, I'd like to say thank you for joining us. Please do stay in touch. You can find out more about BIC and the work we do via our website, uh, which is uh, it's well, it, it was on one of the um, one of the slides. Uh, and if you're keen to stay up to date with our green work and events, do check out the Green Hub and uh, join our dedicated mailing list for all green supply chain matters. Um, we'll make this presentation uh, available on our website shortly, um, and the recording of the whole webinar will be posted onto our YouTube channel very soon. So. Without further ado, then, oh, I'd like to also finally thank our sponsor as well, um, Penguin Random House. And I uh, hope you will join us in the future for another event and um, stay in touch. Thank you very much for attending. Take care. Oh, thanks, Serena. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.